All right, hi. So now we're going to go over the hip, thigh, and pelvis. So there's a lot going on for anatomy and we're not gonna really talk about bones because you can't see the bones on Valerie. So instead what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at some of the muscles and some of the more superficial bones and some of them we've already talked about in some of the other lectures. So what we're going to be looking at first is as we come in, if you feel on the very outside part of your hip, you're gonna feel a bony prominence that sticks out. That is your greater trochanter of your femur. And that's in a really important attachment site for tons of muscles of your hip and your pelvis. So it's important to know about that one. The other one, we talked about the ASIS before. You have two of them, one on each side. The ASIS is again that bony prominence that sticks out when you grab onto your hip, okay? So the best way to find it is you find your iliac crest and then you're gonna come forward and work your way around. Where's your iliac crest at? Right there. <laughs> and then you're gonna come forward and you'll be right on it. Your bones are way different than mine. There we go, right here. Oh, your hip's way lower. Okay, her AIS is about 12 inches lower than mine. So, <laughs> so right here is that bony prominence that's gonna stick out and then from there, we actually, if we go just below that, is your AIIS. So your ASIS is your anterior superior iliac spine. And then you have your anterior inferior iliac spine. Those are important because again, they're attachment sites for lots of muscles in your body. The ASIS is an attachment site for the longest muscle in your body called the sartorius. And it comes here and it runs in diagonal all the way across your anterior thigh and inserts on something that is called Gertie's tubercle. I lied, it's called the pes anserine. <laughs> it's called the pes anserine. And three muscles are going to insert there. One of them is a sartorius. The other is going to be the gracilis, which is the most superficial adductor. So remember, adduction is moving to the middle. So your adductors are on your medial thigh and then we've talked before about your semitendinosus. Remember that that is a posterior muscle on the medial side. So this guy comes here, the gracilis comes here, and then your semitendinosus comes from the back and then wraps around and all of them insert right here on your medial anterior tibia, okay? So then the other one that comes off your AIIS that is your rectus femoris. And you guys should remember that as being the biarticular quad muscle. So remember the quads are going to extend your knee. She has a knee extension right now. And they also flex your hip. Can you flex your hip for me, please? Yep, so bringing your leg all the way up, that is full hip flexion, but any kind of bending is going to be hip flexion in general. So that, which she just did, if she were to use the rectus femoris entirely, she would keep her knee straight and bring her leg up just like that. Look at the ballerina with the toes pointed and everything. That is some serious rectus femoris action going on. The other motion that we're gonna do is called abduction. So abduction is bringing your leg out to the side. A deduction is bringing it into the middle or you can even cross over the midline a little bit. Then we're going to have hip extension, maybe turn sideways a little bit. Hip extension is coming back towards me. Yep, so stand up nice and tall. And then go ahead and face them. We're going to have internal and external rotation of the hip. Now this can get a little bit froggy for people because if she's gonna do internal rotation, her toe will point in. So she's gonna come all the way in. Keep your hips straight for me and come in. She's gonna take her leg and rotate her whole leg in and external rotation is rotating her whole leg out. But when you do it this way, you're also gonna get some tibial motion as we do this. And remember we said when we do the lower leg, we just wanna keep those knees bent and come in and out as we do internal rotation and external rotation. Instead, what you would rather do when we're looking at hip internal rotation is the same thing. Keep your knees flexed and now you need to think about your femur, because we're talking about hip stuff, not our lower leg. And so draw a line straight down the middle of the femur, and then if I bring my foot in, which way did my femur actually go? And my femur 
rotated out, right? So this is external rotation. Don't get thrown off by the foot. Look at how the femur turned. And then if I bring my foot out, right? You see that my femur is actually rotating in. So this is internal rotation of my hip. So external rotation, internal rotation. If I do it straight, I could just twist my lower leg and it looks like that's what's happening, but I'm not doing anything from my hip. So my best advice whenever you're trying to do rotation of the hip is always to do it with a bent knee and do it like this, okay? It's gonna make things far more clear as you're doing things. Do not get thrown off by the position of the foot though because that is not what you're trying to follow. You are trying to follow the femur as you do that, okay? So when we talk about the different muscles, we already talked about the one hip flexor, but we also have deep hip flexors that sit in there. And those are your iliopsoas muscles. We can palpate them. She would definitely need to be laying down and they are kind of tender to get to <laughs> because you have to get through their guts to get to them because they actually come off of your anterior bodies of your backbone. So they're coming off of your lumbar spine. Um, for abduction, we use our gluteus medius primarily, and that runs on this outside part, and then we also have our tensor fascia lata. So one thing about the pelvis is we have two anominates. We have a right side and a left side, and in, in, in the other lecture, you guys all talk a lot more about it, but on the right side, we have the an, or yeah, I'm on your right side. We have the anterior one third is where the tensor fascia lata comes off of, and then the posterior two thirds is where our glute med and min come off of. The tensor fascia lata is what attaches our IT band to our hip. So they all come off the iliac crest, and the IT band runs all the way down the outside of the leg and inserts all the way down here. Remember how I said Gertie's tubercle earlier, and I said I was lying? Gertie's tubercle actually exists but it's on the lateral anterior part of your leg. So if you guys have ever had a tight IT band or felt snapping on the outside of your hip or the outside of your knee, it was probably your IT band. When I had knee surgery, I actually asked my surgeon if he would cut my IT band because it hurt so bad. He refused. Such a jerk. I told him he was being very selfish, but he didn't want to hear about it. So with these, we can have lots of problems with your IT band and it can come up to that you're having a lot of muscle guarding or spasm coming from your uh, TFL, that's what your tensor fascia lata is also called. Um, then again, we have the adductors that are on the inside that are gonna pull you in. And then on the posterior side, go ahead and turn, the main muscle that we have is our gluteus maximus. And our gluteus maximus is the strongest, most powerful big time hip extensor. So remember hip extension is when you bring your leg straight back like that we also talked about how these hamstrings help with this, and hamstrings also do knee flexion. So the glute doesn't come down to the knee, so the glute only does hip extension. The hamstrings help with hip extension, but they're primarily the knee flexors, okay? And then the other thing is we have the ischial tuberosity, which is the bone that we talk about that we sit on. And I know that this is kind of weird, but basically what you do is you come from like right where their leg meets their bum and you kind of push up and you should be able to feel a hard bone that sits right there. And you guys feel it all the time, right? When you sit down on like this hard chair, you're sitting on that hard thing. That is your ischial tuberosity and that is the bone where your all of your hamstring tendons are going to insert upon. Um, I think for the most part, those are the major big ones and I'll talk about the rest of them in, a, in another one. Go ahead and flip around for me. The last thing, and I'll let her touch her own since she's standing up, but the last bone, so we have the ilium up top, that's like the, the crest, right? What people consider their hips. The ischium is the bone that you touch or that you sit on, sorry. And then the pubis is your very front bone. And let me tell you, when you touch it, you are north of the, everything that you care about to not be touched. Um, but if you're going to be palpating it because it's possible for them to get rotated and have all kinds of problems, you always need to talk to your patients about it and make sure that they're comfortable with you touching it. And then if you remember when we did leg length discrepancy, how I had Charlie put his feet on the table and then clear his hips. So we did that back bend and put him down and then I pulled his leg straight. You do the exact same thing because if people are laying all cockeyed on there, it can make it look like things are not um, 
oriented correctly, but really it's because they're just like laying all weird. But the best way to find your pubis is you just take the palm of your hand and start kind of a little bit high and you come down and you're gonna feel that bone that sits right there. And then you should feel a squishy thing in the middle. That is your symphysis pubis, okay? So that is where your, your, ilium, or your ilium, ischium, and pubis are one in nominant. You're gonna need to know that word, in nominant. So you have a right and a left. They come together at your symphysis, pubis symphysis, sorry, anteriorly, and then posterior at your SI joint, your sacral ilio joint. And we'll talk about more of that stuff in, in another one. So the last thing that I wanna talk about as far as anatomy goes, is a femoral triangle. And normally have people lay down, but we're gonna do it with our standing. So what you would do, the femoral triangle is important for a couple of reasons. And we've talked about this, I think a little bit before, we've talked about how you can find your femoral pulse, right? So this is an important thing. If you're worried about blood flow or you're trying to check a pulse really quickly, this is a good place to do it. Also, we talked about if people are, pardon me, overheating, you want to put ice packs on really superficial arteries. So this is a very superficial artery. Remember we said like if you work out really hard, sometimes you can feel your pulse going in, in your hip. That is your femoral artery. So what you do is again, you're going to find the crest and find that ASIS, and then you would find the pubic bone. You want to put your finger in the pubic bone for me? Okay. And then it is directly in between these two things. So it should be right here. And basically it's in your hip fold. So if you can find your hip fold, that's basically where it is. And the order of it, you guys need to know the order. When I talk about it, I usually talk about it as either navy or navel. And it's from lateral to medial. So it goes the femoral nerve, and then there's an A, so it's the artery. Then it's the V, so it's the vein. And then the A actually is for anamosine space. It's basically fat in the middle. And then the L is for the lymphatic tissue. And if you guys have ever been sick, you've maybe felt like a bunch of bumpy things in your hip right there. And that's because your lymphatic nodes are really swollen and they're trying to flush out all that gunk that's coming from your legs and they're trying to get it better. Or if you've had a really bad injury, Maybe it's trying to flush out all that inflammation, but it's really in between this in this point, and it's basically right in your hip fold. But you need to remember nerve, artery, vein, space, which is our anamosine space, so that's the A, and then the L are the lymph nodes. And you would assess it on the right and left side. Now remember, if we have a femur fracture, this is not where we're assessing it, because this is proximal. We need to assess it either in the popliteal fossa on one of our foots or foot uh, arteries or potentially just doing cap refill someplace below it. But you still should really know the femoral triangle because I think it's an important anatomical structure for people to understand, okay? So um, again, quadriceps, only one of them cross the hip. Hamstrings, all of them cross the hip. So the hamstrings are all biarticular muscles. Only one of the quads are biarticular muscles being the rectus femoris. Um, the quads, all of the quads extend the knee, all of the hamstrings flex the knee. Uh, and then we have several other muscles that help with motion and, and that kind of stuff. The other thing that I wanna to touch on really quickly is femoral antiversion and retroversion since I have a nice model here. So right now when she's standing toe in like this, this is antiversion. And this is something that you are technically born with. And what's happening is you're supposed to meet in to your acetabulum. The acetabulum is here on the side of your hip and it's where your ilium, your ischium, and your pubis all come together. It's that cup. So it's the socket of the ball and socket joint because the hip is a ball and socket joint. There's only one other in your body and we're gonna talk about it later, it's the shoulder. So the acetabulum is the socket, the ball sits in there, but what can happen is the neck and the ball aren't situated correctly. And so if we have antiversion, it's rotated anteriorly, which would make you be more toes in or pigeon toed. And then if you have retroversion, think retro is kind of back, right? So it's rotated backwards in, in your acetabulum. So you would be a lot more kind of duck footed with your stance. But again, these aren't things that are because of muscle complications or tightness or weakness. This is legit, if we did x-rays or MRIs on you, we would see bone deformities. 
I will say that this can happen also uh, from, you know, how little kids sit like kind of with their knees out and all that kind of thing for a long time. If they do that frequently, it can actually cause the bone to rotate and you can actually cause your child to have one or, well, probably not both, but one of these problems in their hip. So that's something to think about. Asking your child to sit like in, in a more biomechanically friendly position would probably be a good idea. Um, going back to palpations and, our, and special tests and range of motion, everything, just always make sure that if this is the side that hurts, we start on this side for everything. So if I'm gonna to touch something on this side, I do it first and then I come here. If I'm gonna test motion, I start here first and then I do it here. Strength, special tests, whatever I'm gonna do, because they need to know this is how it feels normally. And it also gives you a sense of what's normal for them. And then you can switch to the other side so that way you have a comparison. Never, ever, ever start with the injured side. And we call this bilateral comparison. If I ever ask about anything, just say bilateral. Every time, it's a really good bet if you do it that way. Okay, so now we're gonna move to some of our tests. And the first one, go ahead and lay down for me, please, Valerie. We're gonna put the feet down here. These are gonna be for hip flexor tightness. So the first one that we're gonna do is called the Kendall test. And the Kendall test, it's a super easy test, okay? And we're really looking at rectus femoris stuff versus when we're looking at the deeper kind of, of hip flexors. So when we do the Thomas test versus the Kendall test, this is how I was taught to do them. So this is how we're gonna kind of do them. In your PowerPoint, they show you in a way that I was never taught to do it because the rectus femoris does something with the knee, right? Versus all of the rest of the hip flexors only deal with what's going on up here at the hips. So when we do the Thomas test, you need to make sure that this leg is really straight and then we're going to take this leg and we're going to fold it and I'm going to say, hey, pull this all the way to your chest and then I'm going to kind of help and I am not testing this leg, I am testing this leg. And what's happening is as we're rotating her pelvis, if this hip flexor is tight, her leg is going to start coming up off the table because as she rotates her pelvis, it's going to make it come up and she's not going to be able to keep it fully down on the table, which is going to be like, oh, it's tight. And then I would do it on the other side and see if it's tight on the other side. It's a 50-50 if that's going to happen. It doesn't necessarily mean it has to be. Now, when I do the Kendall test, I was taught to do it that they actually slide all the way down to the end of the table. So that way their knees are hanging off because this is going to put the rectus femoris on a bigger stretch, right? Because the rectus femoris also does knee extension. So right now it's on a pretty big stretch. And then what we would do is the exact same thing, have her take this leg and we're gonna pull it up. And then if it starts coming up off the table, this is an idea that not just the hip flexors, but specifically the rectus femoris is gonna be a problematic. And what you're gonna see is, instead of her leg hanging down really nice, her knee is going to start extending and or her hip is gonna come off. But mostly what you see is just knee extension happen. So as they lay down, it would be all nice and down like this. And if it's tight, she would come up and her knee would start extending. And it might not go all the way straight like that, but it's certainly not gonna be hanging all the way down like it was before. And then that's a really good way for you to figure out how to differentiate between the upper hip flexor, so your iliopsoas stuff, and then the rectus femoris, okay? So let's slide up a little bit more again, please. All right, the next one we're gonna do is the Patrick test or the Faber's test. And with this, Faber stands for what you're actually going to do. You are going to flex the hip, then you are going to externally rotate the hip and abduct the hip. I kind of said them out of order. Flexion, abduction, and external rotation. Basically, when you do the Faber's test, you're going to put them into a figure four. Okay. Hopefully everybody knows a figure four and what you do is you would kind of just push down like this and if they complain of pain back in their SI joint or tightness up here in their groin, this is going to be a positive test. Typically they complain of pain back here because you're jamming up the SI joint, but if their hip flexors or their really high adductors are really tight, they're also not going to appreciate this test very much. Uh, and then the next test that we're going to do, sorry, I'm making you move all over the place. Go ahead and sit right here. Is the fulcrum test. 
This test you would only do if you think that they have a stress fracture. If you think that they have a full fracture of their femur, you would never ever do this test because a full fractured femur is pretty obvious. So what you're gonna do is you would take the leg, well, do it on the good side first, but take the leg and I just go like this. So you have their leg across your arm and then you're gonna take your hand and on their distal femur, you're going to push down on it, okay? And when you do that, you're causing a fulcrum. So you're going to put stress or bending on that femur. And if they have a stress fracture from here, oops, sorry, from here all the way up through their hip, they are not gonna like it. They're gonna have some pretty significant pain going on and they're gonna be like, please don't do that again. And it might not be, it hurts just right here if it's a stress fracture, because remember stress fractures can kind of be difficult to diagnose. It can kind of have pain a little bit of everywhere but it is certainly something that you will see with some people. So then the next one we're gonna do is called Renee's test. So now we're on to like our IT band tests and stuff. Renee's test is basically they're doing everything. You're gonna have them stand on the good side and bend their knee, so flex their knee, like do a single leg squat to about 30 degrees and then have them stand on their good side and you're gonna feel on their IT band. And if they complain of pain or you feel snappy and popping, as they go from straight to, so I put my hand on it, she would go down in the 30 and then come back up again. And if she has pain doing that right here, or if we feel popping, clicking, that kind of stuff, that is a positive test. Okay, back on the table. So the next test is super easy for clinicians to do because they do nothing. What they do is they ask their patient to flex up their hip to about 45 degrees and then we just ask them to very slowly start to bend their knee. And if they complain of lateral pain, clicking, catching, anything like that on the outside part, this is Noble's test and this is a positive test. And usually it starts happening around 30 degrees because at straight, the IT band is here. And when our IT band or when our knee is flexed, our IT band comes backwards. So it goes from anterior to posterior around 30 degrees is when it moves from the anterior position over your lateral femoral condyle to the posterior position. So as they're moving it in this non-weight bearing position, they get to 30 and it snaps over, that's when they're gonna experience the pain. But again, this is hands off for the clinicians, it's strictly the patient doing that. The difference between this and the test that we did a little bit ago, the Renee's test, is that one's weight bearing this one's not, but this is actually a pretty good, the, I like Renee's better, I'll just say that. Um, and then Ober's test is she's going to lie on the side and then scoot all the way towards me. Um, yep, yeah, perfect. And Ober's test is going to catch, the idea is we're gonna say totally relax and we're gonna bring her leg up into abduction and then I'm going to extend her hip and then I'm going to let it fall and so I kind of want to be like on her iliac crest a little bit I sorry at first I was more on a greater short cancer so up here and as I do it the idea is that she needs to be totally relaxed because I'm trying to catch way down all the way it'll be easy to relax yep so I'm gonna pick it up I'm gonna bring it back and then I'm gonna let it drop down her foot should be able to get at the same level as the table but there are some people that when they do it and you let go, their leg is still up here. And it's not because they're trying. It's because legit, their IT band is so tight that this bad boy is not going <laughs> anywhere. It's, uh, yeah, that sucks for them. And that's gonna be a whole lot of friction massage and other fun things that they're not going to enjoy <laughs> very much to get that better. Um, so then from there, we're going to go, I'm gonna have you scoot to the far side of the table. And we're gonna do the Fadir test. So with the Fadir test, we're really looking at like deep gluteal syndrome and piriformis syndrome because what we're gonna do is we're gonna take their leg, we're gonna flex it up, we're gonna kind of just let it sit, and then we're gonna let them drop all the way down. And the idea is, again, that their knee should be able to drop below the table without pain. But what's gonna happen with some people is they're gonna have pain back here because your piriformis is one of your deep external rotator muscles and you are really stretching the crap out of it and same with your glute and it does not like this position. So what you would do is you would do it on one side and then you would do it on the other side 
and see if they have the same motion and or if they report any pain. And then I'm gonna have you lay on your stomach for me. And so Eli's test, again, is another rectus femoris test. And all you do, again, super easy test, you just say, I'm gonna passively, so do nothing. I'm just gonna flex your knee and I'm gonna see what happens. And then I would do it on this side and do the same thing. If she has rectus femoris tightness, what's gonna happen is as I start coming up, her hip is gonna start coming up off the table because that's gonna try to alleviate some of that stretch because it's gonna flex the hip as I start stretching it down here and that's what's gonna make it feel better for her. The other thing that you'll see, even if the hip doesn't come up, is you'll get about here and you're like, trying to push it on that side and then this side would go a lot further. So typically what you see though is as you continue to try to push it, this hip starts flexing and it comes up off the table. The entire time you're doing it though, it should stay flat on the table if there's no problems. All right, and then I think our last one, go ahead and hop up, is the Trendelenburg test. And this one, remember we said that the gluteus medius is on the outside of your hip, those posterior two thirds of your iliac crest. And what you would do is you would tell your patient to put their hands on their hips so they can just let them hang at their side, either one. And what you would do is say, stand on your good side and remember those ASIS, they should be even as they do this. And then what you would say is, okay, now flip sides. And then if she did that, what you would see is the non-weight bearing hip, not the side she's standing on, but this side is gonna drop because you're assessing the gluteus medius on the opposite side. And just to kind of demonstrate when you're doing it, your gluteus medius does hip A, B, duction, okay? So if you stand up, you need to stay regular like that, but if it's weak, you drop down, that's the same as bringing your leg across, right? If I'm like this, that's the same as coming like this. So the Trendelenburg is a really, really good test for assessing for glute med weakness, and also um, it's an injury that we see kind of frequently. Last, just a quick reminder that leg length discrepancy is still a big thing. We have the anatomic and the functional. Remember the anatomic gets measured from the ASIS to the medial malleolus, and the functional gets measured from the umbilicus to the ASIS, and you have to go to both of them. And, oh, I just said that wrong. It goes from the umbilicus to the medial malleoli. No matter what you're measuring, they go to the medial malleoli, and you need to do the right and the left one, and then you compare them, okay? All right, awesome, thanks.